Welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Library. You know me, Dana Tamanawala. You know my co-host, Gary McGilvery. And joining us today is the Chief Executive Officer of Ellis Don, Jeff Smith. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for being with us. Nice to be here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so I think that everybody knows Ellis Don. You see the signs, you know, even people who are not in real estate from across Canada, they see the signs everywhere and probably across the world. Um, but you have um, big signs. You do. <laughs> you do. It's important. So do so does Collier's, by the way. Um, yeah, we've learned. Yeah. Um, but can you can you give us a little bit of history about uh, Alistair and and how you guys started uh, to give a little context to the audience? Sure. The, the company was started by my by my dad. Uh, in 1951, so we're just coming up to our 70th anniversary. Um, he he was a typical uh, Depression era kid uh, entrepreneur. You know, he didn't have a dad. Newspaper route, selling whatever he could sell. One of one of those guys. I'm not sure that my dad was really a a builder, although he would disagree with that. But he's not around anymore, so I can say whatever I want. But he was a terrific entrepreneur, and uh, and a hard driving businessman. He quit. He was a superintendent at 27 for a company called Foundation, which ended up being part of Acon down in London, Ontario, quit his job, started a company. First job was an addition on a house uh, and with his brother and uh, really started. Is your dad Ellis or, or Don? My dad is Don. My dad is Don Smith. His brother was David Ellis Smith. And uh, Ellis is my grandmother's maiden name. And just a little bit of color there. I, when I was like 30 or 40, I said to him, you know, I've always known about the history of the name of the company, but when you look at it, it's kind of a dumb name. Like, how did you ever come up with Ellis Don? And he said, oh, we were drinking. I said, oh, okay, that, <laughs> that at least explains it. Uh, anyway, and you know what? He just started and he started, he followed the baby boom. He started building public schools and then high schools and then university buildings in the 50s, but then he quickly graduated to whatever he could, whatever he could find, always uh, lump sum tender, always you know low price wins, efficiency wins. Um, he was a hard ass, my dad. He was the toughest guy I ever knew. So that's that's always living on the edge, right? Always growing as fast as he could. I don't know how my mother survived it. Uh, seven kids, that kind of thing. So big family, big, and you know. And then uh, I won't, you know, it depends on how much detail you want to go into, but I was never going to go into the, going to go into the construction business. I went into law school, okay. practiced law for less than a year and decided that wasn't really where my headspace was at. Uh, so I joined, uh, joined Ellis Don and, uh, and, and uh, as the lawyer at the beginning, but then I, I, I kind of went around and took the jobs that nobody else wanted, including going out west because my dad fired everybody, right? So he'd fired the Western Area Vice President four or five times. So finally, nobody could would take that job. So I went out and took it. And I got in 1985, uh, did that for four years, came back and was President COO with him. He was CEO and et cetera and for four or five years. And we fought and fought. And I left the company in 90. Five, just as I was turning 40, it was tough. Things were not going well. Uh, we'll get to the dome later, maybe, but we had some, which was a success, but we had some other issues. And then I came back in 96 and my dad retired, and that's when I became CEO, and we've gone from there. We were doing about 800 million in 96. This year we would have done about 5 billion, but for COVID, so we'll come in about four and a half. Wow. That's, so that's a that's a very quick rundown. Almost, you know, like to love to hear that. That's uh, that's fantastic. That's and and by the way, yeah, very quick rundown. And and we are Garrett and I are a fan of the details. Um, wh- one question I had, like early on when uh, when the company is is just getting into okay, so they're doing an addition on a house, then they're doing public schools. What was it? Was the company still very small back then, or what was it that was allowing them to 
grow at this fast rate and get those larger projects? Well, well, two things. Um, one was that my dad, he was into the details. He worked every night. He made sure every project was was profitable. And then sometime in the early 50s, uh, he didn't have enough money to to fund the growth, right? Because you need performance bonds and that requires cash. And he almost sold the company, but somebody said, oh, go see this as a family. I'm still friends with them, you know, like a generation and a half later. Uh, this guy, uh, uh, Mr. Ivy, we called him. He was a very successful guy in London, Ontario, and would like oh. to help young younger entrepreneurs. So my dad went out to see him and he said, son, never sell your own company, never. I'll give you $250,000. You'll pay me back in five years, and that's how you'll go. And remember, this is 1953. So this so, is, is this the original uh, Ivy? This is the original what? The original Ivy. Yeah. Okay. Of the I think so he may have been second generation, but I don't think so. I think he was the original Ivy. I mean, you know the Ivy Business School and, and all of that, right? So, um, so that's how my dad funded that early growth, and he fired his brother because his brother went out to Calgary and wasn't making any money. And after the first year, you know, they were making money in Ontario, but not in Calgary. But my dad had to pay back 50 grand, a lot of money in the, in the early 50s. Uh, and um, so he said to his brother, that's the end of you. Uh, and uh, it was really my dad's company from then on. Wow. OK. That's how they did it. Interesting. Um, OK, and then and then moving forward so that now we're, we're going rapidly forward but okay so a lot of your projects are through uh the bid tender process right um yeah. can you can you tell us a little bit of it and then soon we'll get into what your company's doing now um with four and a half billion in, in uh revenue uh can you get into some of those larger projects like for instance the sky dome how does that happen what intricacies go into building something of that magnitude and something so different. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that project? Well, yeah, that project was, so now it's 1985, right? So Ellis Don is pretty, a reasonably substantial company uh, operating in Alberta, operating in different parts of Canada. They'd, we'd been international. Um, I'd only been with a company three or four years. I had nothing to do with the Sky Dome. It was the single most, I'm going to tell you most entrepreneurial act I've ever seen anybody uh, do. And and I, I always had mixed emotions with my father, as I've said, we, he's a great a builder. He and I didn't always see, see eye to eye, but unbelievable. Remember the company in terms of its balance sheet was about a 10th of the size it is now. Right. Now you figure inflation, so maybe not that much. And that project was a design build basically operate because that roof had to work in a particular way. It had never been done before anywhere in the world. This, uh, I'm going to say crazy architect, I love this guy, Rod Robbie, uh, came to see my dad and neither of them were mainstream, right? The bigger companies, uh, Eastern and PCL, and were all lining up. And, and we were this London, Ontario company. Rod Robbie says, I got this brilliant idea with this guy named Mike Allen for this roof. And, and they went off and fought all of the establishment guys. And, and uh, again, hard lump sum spec, right? Had to work, you had to have a model that worked, had to prove that it would work, had to guarantee the price. That's a whole other story. And, uh, and, and they won the job and they got a bond. I still don't know how they did it. I, I can tell you that if, if, if that kind of entrepreneurial challenge and risk bet the, bet the company by four times, not just once, came up today, I don't think I'd do it, but he did it. And uh, and it was a huge success. And of course it, it made Ellis Dawn. So, so, so is, is that, that's how it works? Is it that you, you bid a project and say, this is how much it's gonna cost, or this is how much we're gonna charge you. And then you go out and raise funds to, through a bond to, to pay. Well, remember, every project is different, right? So most projects, especially up until the nineties or the, 2000s somebody else would design it you would bid on it you the low price would win and you'd have to build the design etc the the sky dome was a design build so the the architect and all the consultants worked for us so rod robbie and that whole team of consultants uh worked for ellis dawn and we were responsible 
for the whole thing. He didn't really have to go out and raise money in order to fund the construction. Construction tends to fund itself. You just need to have a company that's big enough and financially secure enough that a bonding company will take a risk on you because if you go broke, they've got to finish it mm. with their own money, which of course they don't want to do. So you've got to have that kind of financing. And and Don had that obviously in place because he, he got a bond with his, with his balance sheet. And then you go and you line up in that case, your own subcontractors. So you get... So the big one there was Dominion Bridge had to do the, the roof, right? They designed and built that roof the, and, the, and the, the movable roof. That was one big, we were responsible, of course, but Dominion Bridge, Bridge was a big company at the time. That was their piece of the work. So you bring all that together and, and you go to work. I can tell you just a couple of the stories at one point, And remember, this is like 30 odd years ago, uh, 35, 34, 35 years ago, we were losing on the formwork, you know, the erection of all that concrete, a hundred thousand a week. Holy! Uh, on the cost of the formwork. Later, and and obviously, big panic, thinking about it. Fired these people, hired those people, figure it out somehow. Um, uh, secondly, later on, and people don't really know this at the time, but that roof sits on these big wheels, these big wheel contraptions they called bogies. When they first started testing them, they were shattering. Jeez. So the thing is under construction, counting down the deadlines. There was no release from the schedule. And here your your bogies are shattering, right? But at the same time in the Sky Dome, and people will remember, they go, wow, it costs a lot of money. Right from the beginning, they started changing the design. So we actually got let out of the price, right? Okay. They said, we want a big hotel on the front. You go, right. well, if you want a hotel. And, and by the way, you can't extend the, the, we still need the opening schedule date. Well, so we made some money there. We want all these sky boxes. We want this, we want that. So they changed it dramatically from the beginning, which maybe in the end saved Ellistone. Is this, Jeff, is this Canada Lands Company that it's, like, is this the Canadian government pay? Who's paid for this? Uh, it was, it's a long story. The government was owned by the, or excuse me, the land was originally owned by the by the railway lands, but the, but the uh, contract was with the province of Ontario. Okay. It was okay. with a company called Stadco Stadium Corporation that was a, a, a subsidiary of the province of Ontario. Gotcha. And so you guys did turn a profit out of that? In in the end, uh, we turned a profit out of it. We had a Dominion Bridge came in with this big claim. We were having other problems caused by some other issues in the early 90s when it was all done. And then Dominion Bridge filed a $20 million lawsuit. May not sound like much. Uh, now, but it was a huge amount then. It sounds like a lot now, I know. Uh, so we had to fight that out for a couple of years. In the end, we made money. Didn't make a great fortune, but I think we made our bid profit in the end. So so when they're looking to, to potentially redo the Rogers Centers, are you guys going to be on, at the table? Of course we want to be at the table. You know, I, I figured you were going to ask me, Are you? is everybody all emotional about them threatening to tear down the Sky Dome? Yeah. And I would say to you, the answer is most of those guys, because they're all guys, are retired now. They're still around, but they're retired. Uh, but around here, we say, you want to tear it down? Tear it down. We'll build the next one. Of course, we want to be at the table. Uh, okay. Awesome. <laughs> tear them all down. We don't care. We'll rebuild the whole friggin' thing. That's what we do. Yeah, yeah. That's good, good, for, good for the construction business. I, I would love to see that boardroom when you guys are like... Or, or be at the construction site when the bridge company. So you you have a bridge company building the dome, I guess, because it's similar to a bridge. Is well, that they were just they, that was just the name of the company, Dominion Bridge. Uh, I don't know where they got their name. They were a big steel fabrication supply and construction company. They did every kind of construction. They may have started out doing bridges, but they would have done structural steel on big office buildings. They, they're not around anymore. They actually, uh, I can't remember what happened to them, but they went down in the 90s. Um, but they were they were the big player in structural steel at the time. Right. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And then, and the, uh, what did you call them? The bogies? Those survived, obviously. Well, obviously, they, they, they fixed them up. I remember I was still out west running the, the western operation, at, uh, but I came home one weekend and my I remember my mother having a nervous, not having a nervous breakdown, but being very, very upset. My mother was the warrior. My dad was more the entrepreneur. And he said, don't worry, we'll we'll fix it. <laughs> she said, how are you going to fix it? Don't worry, we'll fix it. 
I don't think he had a clue how he was going to fix it, but obviously they fixed it. They got it done. But they got it done. And and, and back back then, in it was 1989, I think it opened, they were counting down the days on the front page of the Toronto Star every day. And, we, and this big expert comes in from Europe because in Canada, we don't trust our own experts. We need European experts. And he said, they'll never get it done on time. It was very dramatic. And they got the occupancy permit with about, you know, the usual thing with a couple of hours left. It's a lot of it was, it was terrific. Yeah. Wow. What and what like what what would you say is the strangest or most uh, like what are some of the other kind of interesting buildings that you guys have been a part of? And there's so many like, I, you know, I think of, I, you know, I was watching Prison Break on the weekend. And it's and and the and the protagonist has the the architecture of the prison and it's all intricately designed so that nobody can escape and you know all this stuff. Like, are there buildings like that 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 you know have to be meticulously designed and where they? Do you know? Do you know? You get know what I'm asking? So you know, for me, the, the the most interesting buildings were the ones that threw up the biggest sort of challenge in the way we were doing them, as opposed to the physical part of the building um you, you you'll be familiar with i was thinking about this last night the first canadian place you know that tower downtown we had yes. to re we didn't build the original olympia and york built it by themselves but we had to reskin it now in order to reskin it without going into a lot of details you had to throw these towers up the side on the on the east and west side and then we built these frames that are these big structures that hoist up when we were building the towers you're always building on top of yourself right this okay. is the only way to go up the side of a building. And so you're you're putting you're putting s these steel frames up and then tying down these these planks of wood in high winds. And uh, it was about the riskiest thing I'd, I'd ever seen us do. And everybody was watching it. And a couple of times, a couple of the pieces of two by tens actually blew off. If you if you drop something, a hammer. In fact, I think they did drop a hammer once and it went through the glass atrium of the of the food court oh. in the uh anyway we we had this one incident where this two by ten blew off and it blew across and hit another the street blew a, hit another i shouldn't be telling you all this but it was public at the time hit hit a cadillac fairview building they were another client of ours so they weren't very happy and then it actually fell down uh and hit the cables for the streetcar didn't hurt anybody and we had a big meeting and everybody was it was really tense one of the one of the financing people said, "I want your personal guarantee that nothing like this will ever happen again." <laughs> and uh, everybody looked around the table because how do you ever give that guarantee? This is like really really difficult stuff. You're trying to protect the workers. You're trying to protect the people below, which isn't always the same thing, believe it or not. And so everybody was looking at him, and I said to him, "I guarantee it." <laughs> <laughs> and he said, "And he said, good." And then after the meeting, our guys came to me and said, why would you say such a dumb thing? Like, you can't guarantee that. And I said, boys, we weren't getting out of there unless I did. And I got dinner. Like, what? like it was a it was a stupid question. So, frankly, I gave him a stupid answer. Right. But it was a very risky project. The other really risky project that really changed Ellis Don, frankly, was the first uh, PPP, uh, public-private partnership building, which was the uh, William Ulster Hospital in Brampton. It was $400 million. We had never built a $400 million hospital before. This is like 15, 16, maybe nearly 20 years ago. Now we got the job, but we had to, as this one, as you'll, you know, PPP stuff, you have to, you have to finance it. We did. Mm. We had to come up with the money to pay. We had to pay ourselves. We had to design it. We had to build it. And then we had to operate it for 30 years. We're still there operating it today. No construction company had ever done that. We certainly hadn't. We were a much smaller company at the time. I was scared to death most of that time that was under construction. And then and then the, the conservatives were going out of power and the liberals were coming in and Dalton McGinty was going to cancel the project. And we had about 10 million invested and 10 million is a lot of money. And oh, my goodness. So that, you know, that may not look when you look at it now, it looks like another hospital. It was really innovative and it was really something. And it really transformed Ellis Dawn into a different kind of company. 
Interesting. Oh, okay. so one other thing you asked me in your notes, you said, what's it like building in Latvia and some of those places? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get into that a bit, but I got to tell you a story. You got to, if you're doing something like that, and we had a client from Europe who wanted us to go in and it wasn't a complicated building. We sent one of our really uh, adventurous uh, guys over there, a guy named Brad Gregus, and Brad goes over and he, I'm talking to him later and he goes, Jeff, you're over there and there are no lot lines. Nobody's ever like divided the area. Yeah. And yeah. the client is saying, just build the building. And we don't, we said, we don't even know where it goes. There's nothing to measure <laughs> off of. Right. Where do you want us to put it yeah. exactly? And he said, I don't care, just build it. We said, we can't just build it. And then he said to me, he said, Jeff, you just don't, it wasn't a complicated building, but he said, Jeff, if you need concrete in Canada, you go to the, and you're in a different city, you go to the phone book and you look up ready mix companies, you pick up the phone and you call the ready mix company and the ready mix company sends you the concrete. It's pretty simple stuff. He said in Latvia, there's no phone book, there's no phone and there's no ready mix company. So <laughs> what do you do? Right? So it was, we've had some adventurous times over there. Yeah. Places. No, well, that's the one uh, I was looking up on your Wikipedia page and I think it said Ellis Don was the first builder to go in after the Iron Curtain had fallen or something yeah, like that. It, it was in the early to mid 90s. We yeah. were, no, nobody gone in and our, to be fair, it was our client who was being uh, initially entrepreneurial. They said, there's a great opportunity here. Let's go before anybody else goes. And we said, okay, we'll go with you. And uh, I'm gonna put up these prefab, uh, basically warehouse distribution buildings. We ended up only doing two or three or four of them in Lithuania and Latvia. Uh, so yeah, so we just went. Interesting, mm. interesting, and uh, and uh, okay, but what 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 are you guys focusing on now? Like, I mean, look, you guys do everything. You do you do a lot, um, but is it primarily infrastructure projects? Is it are you doing a lot of uh, residential building? Like, what where's how is the time divided at Elliston? Well, let me tell you what we don't do. We don't do single family housing. Right. Uh, we don't do blacktop, right? We're not gonna pave a road from here to North Bay. Um, we do pretty much everything else. Mm. We, have a, we have a large civil division now. It's only 10 years old, but so all the infrastructure that you see we're going up, we just awarded the contract to redo the QEW bridge on, uh, uh, in Mississauga, just as, okay. you're, just as you're going out to, uh, over the Credit River. And uh, so that's a, that's a big civil project we're doing. You know, we're involved in the LRTs. We really like, we're really good. I'll tell you what we're good at and what we're bad at. We're really good at big, complicated buildings. If it's tough, if it's, a, you know, now we're bidding on billion dollar hospitals. If right. it's, you only get like two bidders on that. That'd be us and PCL. Uh, if it's simple, like a high school, we're no good at that. We'll screw it up, and they'll be <laughs> they'll be much smaller companies who are way better than us at, at that kind of thing. Right. Complex and scary. Give us a call. We're your guys. Simple and straightforward. It gets a little more uh, challenging. We um, for us, we just we just not efficient at at uh, wood, you know, frame, wood frame construction, that kind of thing. The other thing that's taking up a lot of our attention right now is we've just opened up our first manufacturing plant. So mm -hmm. we're just starting to produce uh, what they call volumetric modules. You know, the big modules, you build them, you, you put everything inside them for, a, say, a university residence or a long-term care home, including the furniture. You shrink wrap them, you put them on the back of the truck, you take them to the site, you stack them on top of one another and bingo, you've got a, uh, you've oh, got a building. We've just been awarded our first, just literally last week, we signed with the Ontario government uh, a big contract to do uh, long-term care housing at both Humber River Hospital and, uh, uh, and Trillium in, in Mississauga. So we've got this brand new plant, we're frankly just getting going. And that's we've got a big job that's going to fill up the plant for a year. So we we're very focused on not screwing that up. So the and the long term the long term care. How many uh, residences would that be? Or I'm how trying to remember. I was going to check this morning because I knew you'd ask. But um, it's about a thousand modules, and it's um, it's I, I can't remember the exact number on both 
hospitals, of, but anyway, several hundred residences, right? Yeah. And of course, the Ontario government is in a hurry to get them because of some of the COVID issues they've had, and they've got a, you know, we, we've got a shortage, so everybody's in a big rush there. So we got to, we've got to do a good job. Are, are you sorry, Gary? Last question here um, for a second, but are you finding that the construct, the cost to build that is substantially cheaper, or like what about it is so interesting? Is you're seeing modular homes pop up all over the place? Um, what's in well right now uh, what's interesting why it's attractive is you can build it way faster hmm. right you can you can you you can basically manufacture get if you get the you get these modules running off a line you could work 24 hours a day if you want inside the factory then you go and you and you yeah, i'm oversimplifying you stack them on top of one another fix them up and you're done it's just way faster than other types of construction than the conventional construction it isn't cheaper but right now it's not more expensive either it's a bit on a par we think gradually it will become uh less expensive as the as that side of the industry matures and the last part of it is you can you can um, maintain your quality better in a factory than you can you know out, out on a job site so those are the three attractions to it but it's right now there isn't a cost advantage it's about it's about equal interesting um, so Jeff, talking a bit about sort of the future and, and where things are going, wh where do you see the largest innovations coming down in the construction industry? Uh, three areas of, of uh, real priority for us. One is sustainability. We need to build much more than we have in the past buildings that A, are built sustainably, meaning the the materials you use to build them, the way you bring the materials to the plant, uh, and they need to operate sustainably, right? They need to be zero carbon. They need to even be carbon, uh, not just carbon neutral, but carbon negative, meaning you're you're not you're not uh, using any. Nobody, as we go forward, is going to allow construction to be as destructive to the environment as it's been in the past. Uh, so, and as I say, that includes how we're building and what we're building. So that is a big issue all around our design, all around construction sciences, all around the supply chain. So that's a big issue. Related to that is mass timber. You're going to see much more in the way of wood buildings. We've got a whole mass timber team here and several projects under construction. So you're going to see a lot more of that innovation that's coming out of the IT world, both it's, around. Sorry, sorry. Jeff, just before you, you discuss the IT, is mass timber, is is there something about it that's great other than the fact that it looks amazing? Or is it? Yeah, it's it's it doesn't use up nearly, um, it, it's not nearly offensive in producing carbon as concrete and steel. Concrete okay. and steel are great building materials, but they're they're not very friendly to the environment. Mass timber actually is, is the opposite, right? It, it consumes carbon rather than produces it. Okay. Uh, and now the mass timber, the science of mass timber construction is getting us so we can build, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 story buildings right out of timber. And as you say, it, it looks uh, fabulous. Like yeah. it's really attractive. So, so it's, an, it's an environmental thing. I already mentioned manufacturing, that's a big innovation. So the other one I was gonna to get to was, was just the, the process of construction. The, the, we're going to, construction as everyone knows has always been a very inefficient business. We've never, we haven't improved productivity, I think in 50 years or something in construction. IT to put, um, is going to disrupt the supply chains, it's gonna shorten them. It's going to make it, whether it affects construction schedules or not, it's it's going to cut the cost of construction dramatically. So I think 10 years from now in real dollars, construction will be significantly cheaper than it is just software driven. And then of course, there's all the data that comes out of that and AI. So if you can analyze, if you can figure out uh, by, by getting the right data, that's the trick here, what 
makes a building, a construction a project successful, and you cut out, say, subcontractor bankruptcy, subcontractor defaults, you cut out four steps in a 10-step process just because you don't need them anymore, saves money, saves time, saves risk. So IT is going to disrupt and is in the process of disrupting our business. Uh, you'll see great changes there. Those are the main drivers of, oh, and then you, you mentioned in one of your questions, just the materials and what you can do with design now, right? Mm -hmm. So buildings are becoming, uh, don't think so much about the physical design, although Frank Geary obviously showed us 10 years ago, we can do whatever we want with buildings um, and, and make them exactly what we want. But think about what's happening inside the building systems inside the way a building lives and breathes. Buildings are becoming experiences now. They're not, they won't in the future be considered to be structures that you go in and, and you adapt to the structure. The structure and the systems in the building will adapt to you. What is the experience that everybody gets from that building? That will be the definition. So that's all about mechanical, electrical, IT, you know, artificial intelligence, virtual, uh, reality, all of that inside the building. And that building is going to have to be a living thing insofar as it's going to need to continue to adapt over the course of 20 or 30 years and change to the changing needs of its consumers. That's the big change in buildings that you're going to see. Not how they look from the outside, mm -hmm. but what they're doing on the inside. That's the future of construction. I wonder, I wonder if you could ever start selling buildings like a, like a Tesla, where they have all these features built in and you say, all right, well, pay me a subscription. And now you have, you know, in Tesla, Tesla would be the automated driving, right? And you say, now the windows can flick on Unlock and Unlock features. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. that's exactly, that's exactly what will happen. We, we actually, uh, Ellis Don did, our own people designed an app I got to remember if I've signed an NDA on this. But anyway, for a very high tech company that you would think would produce, uh, you know, the uh, the the app to protect it from es uh, industrial espionage. It's all about the blinds and when they go up and down because they're worried about people uh, in the buildings beside them stealing their secrets by looking in through the window. So we produced an app that that protected them from that. We did that software ourselves. That's the future. Interesting. Well, and that works on the windows, or it works on the blinds. Maybe. maybe yeah, it works. It works on the building system. I I think most of them are probably windows based, uh, but it'll change. At Elliston, we're 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 agnostic as to what. Sometimes we create the technology, and sometimes, as you say, we we obviously don't create the platform. Uh, we'll use somebody else's platform, but we don't care whose platform we use. We just we just want to make sure it's adaptive and able to change. In, in the coming years. So we're not just building buildings now. In a lot of buildings, we're in running the digital systems. We have a department called Smart Buildings uh, that actually runs buildings, for, designs those apps, installs them, and runs them for our clients. Very cool. Interesting. Um, when it comes to sort of the structural side of things, Obviously, there's there's severe limitations going over, say, like 100 stories and stuff like that in terms of building to building. Are we ever going to see in sort of the near to midterm future those types of any type of innovation that's going to occur that will unlock our ability to build those types of structures that are, say, two, 300 stories? Yeah, I was thinking yeah. about this last night because I knew the question was coming. And I think here's what you need to know here. We're not limited in terms of our ability to build two or 300 story buildings by, by building technology, by building materials, concrete and steel, I'm sure we can do that pretty much right, right now. We're limited by, so the, the answer to your question, I think is not in the short term, not in the medium term. I don't see it, but it's not a construction technology question, you know, in terms of materials, it's a, it's a couple of things. One I already mentioned, sustainability. If, this, if the buildings aren't carbon neutral, pretty soon they're not going to get built. Do we know how to build carbon neutral 200-story buildings? And the answer is not yet. The second one is, remember, I, 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 I called it in my notes here, transit. How do you get people up and down that building? You almost need 
you know, you mentioned Tesla. They're they're, they're experimenting with supersonic transport now, right? Mm -hmm. Can the human? You almost need something ultra beyond be, almost beyond our vision in terms of moving people up and down that building. Because the third thing is sociology. We're, we're, buildings need to serve people's quality of life. It's not just getting them up to an office tower and putting 10,000 people or way more in a building. It's what kind of quality of life do they have? Where do they go for a drink? How do they interact with people? Where do they, do they have a real life there? And you're seeing design adapt itself much more to those kinds of concerns than just going higher. So I'm not saying never, I just don't see it in the, uh, in the short run. Not over a hundred. I may be wrong, but I think, as I said, it's more about what's going on inside the building than the the height and structure of the building. Right. I'm. I was thinking. By the way, this question came out of Garrett was thinking of uh, in in what's it called, Judge Dredd. You've seen that, and they have. Yeah, these, it was a it was a movie that uh, they have these mega complexes where they're again they're they're touching the stratosphere effectively in terms of size and they cover you know massive city blocks and they hold eight to ten thousand residents type of thing so i like i i wonder maybe the vertical you know getting people up and down the structure wouldn't be as much of a problem if they never had to leave if there were like bridges to other you know you could just exist in the sky uh so, whether or not that's a good quality of life i don't know but well, but that's the thing, right? So I was, I took part in a, a real estate industry development uh, webcast a few a month or so ago. And what they were talking about, what they call them, not instant cities, but, but localized. So they want everything, people want everything within 10 minutes of, of where you live and work. So you never have to go, you know, c commute downtown to one of these 300 story buildings. Ask yourself, Okay, if it's big enough and it covers the city block and it's 300 stories high and you never have to go outside, would you want to live in that? <laughs> shoot me, right? <laughs> and 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 I just don't see it. Maybe I'm wrong. I think if if design and construction can't make life better for people, if all it's going to do is lock us into a great big huge building, I think people will rebel. I think there will be no truck with that. So is the technology there? Absolutely. Is it something that will serve the human race and the quality of indi people, individuals' lives? It, does, it doesn't, and I think that's your problem. Interesting. Gotcha. Um, one, one question I, I had, one of my colleagues was just kind of mentioning this. Like, do, you ever, do you ever consider getting into the development yourself? Like, you, you, know, you mentioned that uh, Brampton Hospital uh, deal where you, you were more of a long-term partner in that or participant in that for 30 years um you know with construction companies being able to build this stuff more efficiently than uh you know the developer which hires the construction company would you guys ever consider just doing the development and i guess going through that whole exercise yourself we well so the one thing we learned out of the public private partnerships is how to finance projects uh, and we have great relationships with equity providers, uh, you know, the, 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 the big pension funds, the big life insurance companies, and also with the lenders. That would be the banks, also the life insurance companies. So we've got all that and we've got a really good team here. Uh, so the answer is yes and no. We never want to uh, compete with our clients, right? We work for all these developers. They're our friends. They're our clients. But sometimes... Uh, not infrequently in the world is changing as we get good relationships with our with with some of them they say yeah why don't you put some some skin in the game here let's let's align our interests we do it all open book anyway it's not now it's not we talked about this earlier it's not lump sum low price get the job build it go away right uh, now you've got these buildings that where we're involved in the design the construction and the ongoing operation and the client says, well, if it's all open book and we're all, why don't you put some money in? We'll say, sure, we'll put some money in. So yes, yes, but no, we're not, we'll never compete with our clients, but will we work alongside our clients and where they want us to put in equity? Sure, why not? Whether a, a project or some form of innovation, what are you most excited about uh, right now? 
For me, I'm most excited and most worried about um, the a couple other things we've already talked about. One is sustainability. And how do we transform the construction industry so that it is zero carbon, so that we are part we are part of making our planet more livable, while at the same time giving our clients what they need. This is this is going to completely uh, change construction. It's a huge opportunity, not just to be a leader in an important field, but frankly to be part of the environmental challenge that the planet is uh, facing. And the second one for me is the digital revolution that's about to hit our our industry because it, it is going to disrupt supply chains meaning all our subcontractors the way buildings have been procured by our clients and by us for the last 50 60 years that's all going to change every the construction industry in terms of its participants and how they work together that's all going that won't look the same in 10 years and the last thing is that software is driving you know, the software programs that do design and the software programs that do construction and the software programs that run buildings, they are merging. Mm. And so you're either in that software game or you're a commodity supplying somebody who controls it. So those those two or three things are the big are the things that really excite me. They're terrific opportunities for Ellis Don and our industry, but they're terrific threats too. If you're not on your game with those ones, you're in manufacturing, I mentioned, you're probably out of the game. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Well, uh, Jeff, thank you so much. This has been, you know, I, by the way, I hope that uh, when I'm at your stage, I'm still this forward looking and, you know, it's, it's I'm really, very young. I just look old. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm 30 years old. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I know people are going to get a lot from this. Thank you, Jeff. Well, terrific. I've enjoyed talking to you and uh, happy to do it again in a year or so. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks. Take care, Jeff.